uh, well, again, good afternoon, good morning, actually, still. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we have been doing uh, on the Regulatory Affairs team and some of our interactions within NATPA. And it was a really great transition because most of what I'm going to talk about is our regulatory challenges and advocacy. So as I mentioned, how can I change this? There you go. So as I mentioned, um, I actually want to talk about these topics uh, because block when we talk about like sustainability and blockchain, we are actually talking about like three main topics. So the technology itself, the partnerships and regulation around the technology. But then first I wanted to make some comments about the previous panel because actually they did like a great introduction for some of the topics that I'm going to, to, to discuss with you um, on the next couple of minutes. The first one was uh, about regulation and is when do we need regulation and if we need regulation or we can have like different frameworks such as uh, a self-regulatory framework. Um, and in this, uh, in this particular topic, it is really important uh, to, to actually like make some, or like remember a little bit of what happened with the MICAR. MICAR is the Marketing Crypto Assets Regulation, which um, uh, is implemented here in Europe. It just passed the debates a couple of weeks ago. But actually, regulators made a conscious and a strategic decision of leaving DeFi and NFTs out of the scope. And the main reason is because it is way too early to regulate and there are like different use cases and trying to implement a one fits all um, regulu uh, regulu uh, uh, regulation for, for MICAR or like for NFTs, for example, would potentially uh, stop innovation. So it was a really conscious decision on just let the industry keep flourish and then we will see which type of regulation we will need and how we will implement it. And then the second remark that I wanted to do about some of the topics that were discussed, especially what Regina was mentioning, uh, is that like everyone comes with a with a baggage, and this like legacy thinking is like is is in everyone. Like that's something that we can not think that we can get rid of it uh, from one day to another, especially for those that are switching to the technology sector. I myself, I'm a lawyer, and I was working for the development sector in the past. Uh, which is a good thing, uh, actually, because it allows me to understand some of the challenges that they face and actually facilitates the job that I'm doing right now. But also you come with biases and we need to understand those to try to understand how to address them. And this is mostly done with advocacy and education, which is one of the key, key areas that I've been working in the last couple of years. So we need to educate, also understanding who is the person that we are educating or uh, sharing the knowledge with, like is it regular people and which is the kind of uh, understanding they need from the technology. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see that like, uh, for example, I see Adri there, uh, Energy Nib, like has like a super user-friendly um, interface, but people don't even need to know that there is blockchain in the back and they can use it and it's and is, and is useful for them. Um, but when we come to regulators, we need a second layer of understanding, right? Because if they're creating the rules of the game, well, they need to actually know how the game is played and what is happening in the back so they actually understand where regulation is needed and how they can impact the industry. And then, of course, we also need to educate industry players in how regulatory process happen so they can have a voice and, and talk to the regulators and explain what is it that they're doing. That said, I want to talk a little bit about what we are doing with the IOTA Foundation and within ADPA uh, in, in, these, in these different areas. Uh, you have heard a lot about what is going on with DAOs and with um, the community governance uh, from Holger. And I'm sure that like other people from the team is going to go more into what is going on with the research and the development of the protocol itself. But I'm just going to focus on what I do, which is our regulation. And within that, I'm going to walk you through all the different activities that we are implementing. And I'm going to share some, some, some next events that we have and an initiative where you can actually engage uh, with us. 
So let's start with the Yota. So one of the things that we have been doing is actually we start uh, these uh, monthly sessions of let's talk about regulation. And this is also to educate uh, the community in what is going on at the regulatory level. As I mentioned, it's not only important to educate regulators on how blockchain works, what are the different use cases, what is going on on, on on the ecosystem, but also it's important for everyone in the ecosystem to understand what is the regulatory landscape, because these rules are going to apply now or in a couple of years uh, to you, and you will need to know how to actually implement them, how to be compliant, and how they can impact the, the use cases that you're working in. So this is a really cool opportunity for everyone in the community to attend. Um, I'm in contact with different experts in different topics. We have one on MECAR, GDPR, NFTs. Uh, we have one in taxation uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and these are like really important topics. And you can just go there, talk to the expert. You can make all kinds of questions. And this also generates uh, potential uh, collaborations in the future. For example, I know that for the... Um, the governance structure, you have been talking to one of the lawyers that I brought uh, for the GDPR and the NFTs uh, session, which is really good because those contacts are there for you to use. Um, so this is also like an invitation for you to, to join those sessions. Is there is a particular topic that you would like to discuss? Uh, we have been mostly cover um, Europe, uh, but if there is another topic that you would like to discuss, I'm, I'm always uh, happy to, to get some suggestions or what are the key points that you would like to get more information about. Then this is a really, really interesting project. Um, we are almost done with it, but we... Since last year, I think we started in July or August, we started to organize four roundtables with uh, certain community um, members and regulators. We have one about everything that is uh, concerning self-hosted wallets and digital identities and reusable KYC. We have one on NFTs beyond art. We have one on tokenization, and the last one was in actually the impact of regulation to, to SMEs and startups. In each of those sessions, we have people from the, uh, the commission uh, or the parliament, the European parliament, and, um, and industry players and our community members talking about what were the key points, not only in terms of the development of the technology, but also the potential uh, that these technologies can bring uh, in, a, in a global scale. And it was really interesting discussions because the regulators share some of the misconceptions they have and also like some of the doubts or misunderstandings they have uh, on the technology and directly the community uh, could contribute and clarify this. So at the end, the regulator had not only a better understanding of the industry, but a more positive one. Um, we created some reports with, with these four events, and we are going to publish a consolidated report with all the outcomes and like the major pain points that regulators highlighted, as well as where are like the most um, key points for, for the industry where when, when, when thinking in, in, in use cases and regulation. So uh, I hope like we have that ready in like the next, and probably in one month, and then I'm, I'm going to make sure to, to, to share it with all of you because it's a really interesting um, um, exercise uh, of like improving dialogue with regulators. And this is one of the things that we are going to continue advocated for because we believe that this is the only way in which regulators will actually understand the, um, the needs of the industry, but also is like giving back the voice to, to startups and small players so you don't have the big lobby agencies being the ones represented the voice of the industry, but actually the industry itself talking by themselves. Um, the other um, report that I've been working is the DeFi definition. Um, I think that definition is one of the main key points for the industry right now. Um, uh, there's another exercise going on on staking because uh, everyone is talking about different things when we refer to DeFi or staking and some other concepts. Um, and the issue with this is that if we don't understand what we are talking about, Regulators will not understand either, and they're going to start regulated based on misconceptions. So we conducted a survey uh, where over 140 
people participate in what is the understanding of DeFi for them. And it was people from the industry. We have a lot of participation of VCs and investors, which was really uh, surprising in a good way. We are also validating those outcomes um, with uh, the Academic Advisory Board of INADPA, and we have some regulatory experts that are going to, to join and provide feedback, and this is also people coming directly from the European Commission. Um, this is going to also be a report. Uh, we are using most of the information that we collected here also to reply to some of the consultations that are done by bank authorities, especially in France, uh, in regards to uh, a potential DeFi regulation. So this was a really interesting exercise. I'm more than happy to share also the results with all of you. Um, you can see some of the of the early results uh, here where most of the people understand DeFi as a new financial system, uh, which is also like a really interesting concept because it's not only focusing on the different characteristics that the technology should have, such as the decentralization of the protocol or the governance structure, but actually it's more like a philosophical uh, approach uh, to a new system. Um, again, this is really interesting uh, report I'm going to share with all of you, and um, you can always provide feedback if, if you want to contact me. Then there's a lot of things that I've been doing lately in advocating for the IOTA community projects. Um, I participated in a lot of events uh, talking about uh, the potential of blockchain for sustainable future, uh, blockchain for camera actions, uh, the challenges of, of uh, blockchain and regulation. And mostly what I do is pre-selecting some of uh, the use cases that I see in our community. Uh, also, if you have a cool use case, like always feel free to reach out to me or Holger and Antonio, and they will just like uh, give me the information. Because one of the things that I have noticed is that when we talk to people that is not 100% within the blockchain bubble, they understand better if you present examples. And the projects that we have in our community actually like are the best examples uh, I can use to showcase what is the power and the potential of the technology. So this is actually like something that I've been like doing quite a lot in the last uh, couple of months. Um, yesterday I was also in an event in Leipzig about the future of health. Um, I was the only person talking about blockchain and I presented uh, some of the use cases, not only on the health uh, sector, but also like how we have um, uh, some projects that can be adapted for the health industry, Energy NIP was one of them, of course, because of the incentive in, in, in data sharing. So this is a really interesting um, spaces because I'm not talking all the time to the same people that already knows about IOTA, that already knows about the projects in the community, but it's a completely new um, ecosystem of organizations and people that might be interested in, in working with IOTA and getting more into the Web3 ecosystem. Um, also, there are a lot of reports that we have published with, uh, with INADPA, um, articles as well. Uh, we published one with the EU both that we work with Nakama. Um, again, this is an invitation. If there is a topic you want to uh, write about it, just always send me a message. We can take a look and see how that aligns with our priorities. Um, events, as I mentioned, a lot of events in 2022 and 2023 already. Um, and that's mostly what I've been doing with, with IOTA, which is basically like all of this uh, bridging between regulation and, uh, and the industry. Um, we are doing also a lot of things in monitoring regulation. I didn't have a slide for that, uh, but for example, um, the anti-money laundry and, um, and financing of terrorism law uh, is being negotiated now on the on the parliament started parliament and commission and and the council started yesterday uh, we are putting together a position paper as iota foundation on our main concerns about the regulation and how that piece of regulation can actually impact uh, the industry in not such a positive way and also addressing some of the misconceptions that regulate regulators have um we're going to make public that position paper soon. I will invite you to read it because it's, it's really important. Uh, okay, now within NADPA, um, there's a lot of things that we have done with NADPA. I 
sit on the board of directors of INADPA, where I can oversee like different um, different topics. Um, mostly right now, from that position, I'm working on the reply to the ACPR consultation. This is bank authorities in regards to DeFi. Uh, we managed to actually bring together different organizations. It's the first time that there is going to be such a big joint reply. We have INADPA. European Blockchain Association, uh, the European Crypto Initiative, the um, uh, European Blockchain Observatorium Forum, uh, and the GBBC plus IOTA as one voice. And also we collected information for over 20, 30 um, different industry players on the on the on the ecosystem. I'm happy to say that Holger and Nakama also participated and, and provided some some input to, to, to their reply. Uh, and this is one of the things that I do uh, from from the board as well, kind of like trying to support in understanding where the priorities are, and of course, uh, potential regulation from the French government on DeFi was a was a key point to address. But I also lead everything in regards to social impact and sustainability. And most of the things that we have been doing are based on a report that we conducted in 2021 where we interview 69 projects and we ask them about challenges and opportunities when implementing blockchain for, for good. I'm happy to say that like a lot of people that were implementing like these amazing projects were in the IOTA ecosystem. So that was uh, already a good, a good uh, incentive to keep working on this area. And the survey actually ended in a report that showcased that, that there was, again, misunderstanding and conceptions of, of social impact, but also how projects were measuring social impact. So we worked uh, last year on a social impact definition for the blockchain sector. That is the one that you see here. And I've been advocating a lot in different spaces for uh, blockchain projects to use this definition when they're referring to, 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 to the impact that they're creating. And this is basically because this can attract a new ecosystem of investors for the projects. So... You, when you are working on sustainability or social impact as a blockchain project, sometimes you're not even new or like had this as a primary goal, but doesn't mean that you are not um, not going in that direction. And this is why we added like this component of uh, intentionality in the definition, because sometimes you are not planning to do it, but because of the impact that you have in society, you are you are creating this uh, impact, whether it's like um, sustainable development goals or not. And we wanted to show projects that they can actually use this impact that they're generating to approach uh, other stakeholders and investors, such as angel investors or impact investors that normally are not so into the Web3 space, but they do care about like what is the final impact in societies and communities. Um, to do that, we also generated a model because uh, actually like measuring impact is one of the most complex topics ever. And if you are a blockchain project, probably you don't have experience on impact monitoring, impact measurement, or impact assessments. And the models are really, really complex. And sometimes they have a paywall, and or you will need like experts to come into your team to actually do this for you. So this was already a barrier. So what we did was analyzing an insane amount of different models, try to simplify them and pre-select on some steps that are super easy to implement uh, for blockchain projects, creating a baseline so you understand what was the situation before you actually implement your project so you can measure what was the impact that you have at the end. So simple, simple steps, you can implement one, 10, or all of them. I think that there are 50, over 50 at the end. Um, and this will help you to actually like monitor your impact and measure it. And what is interesting also is that like when you are a startup, you don't need to be compliant with like impact monitoring. But once you scale and depending on the region, sometimes it's like when you have like over 250 employees, you will need to start be compliant with some of these standards. So these, uh, these small steps actually help the startups and the projects to see how they can start implementing some of these um, monitoring requirements into the process before they actually need to or like are forced to, to report on them. Um, we did a really funny exercise uh, on Berlin with some startups. And also I think that like I have the Sparkasse, some, some people from the Sparkasse on the exercise in trying to brainstorm a solution um, of uh, blockchain projects for, for, for impact. This one I think that we did in oceans, uh, applications for oceans protection. And we actually ran through the model and it was a really interesting and, and useful exercise. 
there is also a paper out there. I don't know who will share the slides or if like you can share them afterwards, but I leave links to absolutely everything that I'm saying on, on the presentation. Um, then the I think this is the last thing that I wanted to mention about what we're doing with INATPA. This is both INATPA, yeah, this is with the Social Impact Working Group. Um, we are uh, running like three different activities this year. So we are running a report on Latin American countries uh, on projects working on the SDGs. Here I've been also like talking to Gabby, who is also a member of the IOTA community and translates everything to Spanish and is doing an amazing work uh, to identify some of the projects. And we're also doing a podcast on refi and financial inclusion. Uh, I have like some of the IOTA community projects participating on the podcast. And the first one on the slide, uh, but the last one to mention, is that both IOTA and INADPA are part of the steering committee of an initiative called BC100 Plus that has the patronage of the president of the UN General Assembly. And basically what we have been doing is try to advocate for creating a bridge between Web3 and Web2 organizations. So how the organizations in the development sector or organizations working or like traditional organizations working on sustainability topics can make use of blockchain projects or blockchain tools that are being generated um, so they can actually like have a better implementation, uh, more impact and be more efficient. One of those, for example, is uh, NFTs. So you have seen like a lot of like NFTs being used uh, in auctions to actually collect funds, but also you have like everything in regards to uh, carbon market credits and how to make it more transparent and like avoid greenwashing. So how we can actually like bridge these two worlds uh, towards some, um, or like with the, with the goal of like building a more sustainable future. Uh, we have a lot of organizations there, like all of the ones that you see there are steering committee members. Right now we are working on a manifest a manifesto that is going to be published in the next two weeks. And uh, organizations on the blockchain sector, whether they're working with uh, sustainability topics or not, can sign up to be in contact with the UN, uh, Save the Children, and other organizations that are going to be part of this initiative and are interested in learning more about what is going on uh, on the Web3 space and the blockchain industry so they can implement those solutions. Last uh, but not least, uh, this is an invitation of a series of events that we are in, um, organizing with BC100+. Plus. The first one is a hybrid conference that is happening in collaboration with the University of Torino about uh, governance transformation uh, from global to, to local. And the second one is an on-site, a three days event that we are hosting in Berlin, uh, where we are going to have discussions about blockchain for sustainability, blockchain for good. We will have people from Touchpoint explaining everything that they have been doing with the community and how IOTA is actually empower um, their community to, to thrive and to like get the different support that they will need to, to bring these projects to life and scale. Um, and I think, ah, the last thing I wanted to mention is like actually like a, um, like a good thing that happened last year and is that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, advocacy is really, really important and advocacy comes hand by hand with education and the European Action Plan to digitalize the energy system, which is a uh, official document coming from the European Union institutions actually recognize the job that we have been doing with the Social Impact and Sustainability Working Group as, as an example for, for the kind of initiative that the industry need more to advocate and educate on, on blockchain. And I think that was me. I don't know if there is any questions or comments. Otherwise, if the moderator is there and let me know what I need to do. Silence. Okay, then I guess that was me. Oh, you're back. Thank you. I didn't know what I needed to do. <laughs> I cannot hear you. Nope. It wouldn't be a tech conference if we don't have technical problems. So now we can, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So, so you just uh, were a little bit faster than we expected, but uh, nonetheless, thank you very much for your presentation. And um, yeah, maybe we'll see if there were some questions from the chat first, and then we can go and talk a little bit about it. Um, so we're just maybe first off to start to start the whole thing off. This was much thanks for the presentation. All right, from Marcel Adolf. <laughs> um, First of all, so you were talking a lot about regulations, right? And um, it was also the, the topic on our panel talk that you wanted to be a part of, or would have been nice if you would have been a part of it, right? So uh, could you maybe go a little bit more end up on that, on your personal stance on uh, the whole topic? Yeah, sure. Um, so there is different regulations that are being um, that are on, on the table right now. So one of them is the Data Act, and I think the Data Act is is, a, is one that is a key because it has a reference to smart contracts. Uh, and what we did there was actually like have a thorough review with like different organizations. Uh, one of them, actually, the leading organization in this in this reply was the European Crypt Initiative. And actually, our main request was to one take away or like remove the reference to to a smart contracts from the regulation, or actually clarify that um, these are smart contracts that are not for the blockchain and the DLT space. Because if you go into the description, actually they were not referring that much to what we do with like a smart contracts but most about actually like compliance in terms of like data sharing um, directly on, on terms and conditions. So that, that's a really interesting paper. And I think that is a really ambitious um, call that we did there of like, please remove completely this. Um, if it goes well, it will be amazing. Otherwise we will push for more clarification. So actually the DLT space list uh, is, is out of, of, of this regulation. The second one that we have been discussing right now, and as I mentioned, the conversations started yesterday on on between the Parliament, the Commission, and and the and the Council. It's, it's called Trialogues, is the anti money laundry uh, legislation, and this one has really interesting um, approaches, especially for like self-hosted uh, wallets. We are like pushing a lot for like. Um, increasing the thresholds or like uh, not limiting what uh, the interactions that a, a self-hosted wallet can have or actually like mandatorily put it on, on the level of a CASP. CASP is crypto asset service providers under the understanding of the media regulation. Um, so one of the, or I think like the most interesting thing on this one is that Article 59 actually generates the thresholds uh, for cash. Uh, cash payment. So, for example, how how big a payment needs to be in cash for me as the one that is receiving the payment to actually request information on the pay on the person that is making the payment. Normally, it's like name, address, or like an an an, an, an identity number. Uh, and this goes from like is negotiating between seventy k and and ten thousand uh, euros. And what is funny is just like for crypto, this threshold was one thousand euros. So immediately gives the idea that regulators perceive crypto as more uh, prone for money laundering and financing of terrorism than cash itself, which is a completely misconception as I see it, because this is based on fear and misunderstanding or like lack of knowledge rather than actual numbers. Because when you go and check the numbers of like how much uh, actually like crypto is going into into these areas is like less than three percent in comparison to cash, and these are numbers that are didn't create like these are like reports that you have from a uh, chain analyze and also the United Nations. So it's like crazy to see how this misconception or like maybe it's not like misconceptions, but actually like the lack of understanding and ignorance, if you can say it like that generates fear and fear immediately puts walls and then we go on like risk reaction of like we don't want to we don't want to not even risk it here but at the end is there really a risk is like the risk bigger than cash so this is one of the things that we're gonna actually like try to push and it's just like just this is not proportional you are talking about proportionality take a look at the numbers this is not the way to approach you're gonna um probably reduce uh, um, or like limitate innovation as well. And then the other thing they did, uh, which this was actually coming from the parliament directly, they proposed to 
add NFTs and DeFi, which for me is like a clear mistake right now because also they understand NFTs in the sense of art. So in the same article that they are, that they are including NFTs in NFT platform as obligated entities, Article 3, um, they, they have, um, they're also talking about like a lottery and art. And I'm just like, okay, guys, like, NFTs are not just art. We just need to understand the broader scope of NFT applications. Like an NFT can be anything. It can be also like a birth certificate, like how you are going to put that like into AML or how you're going to put the same conditions to everyone on the NFT space, NFT platforms, like this once fits all kind of regulation. It, it won't work. And it was also interesting because Nikar left, and I mentioned this at the beginning, They the regulators left DeFi and NFTs completely out of the scope with, with NFTs. Nah. But like they were out of the scope for strategic purposes. It's because it is too early to regulate them yet. We have not seen the full potential. We have not seen the full, full uh, development on these areas. So putting like regulation that can be too restricted might work against us, especially in Europe, because then the startup will migrate to another, another region, you know? So I think that these are like the most interesting ones that are being negotiated in Europe, at least. There is like a couple of other things going on. Uh, for example, uh, in in Dubai, in the MENA region, they also have an, a, a consultation open that closed today about DLP foundations, which is a super interesting approach because they're generating a new set of rules for companies that want to, like in the, in the DLT space, that want to go and, and create a company in, in Abu Dhabi in Dubai, uh, which I think that is really, really cool. They also uh, have like some, some reference to DAO that are super open. Um, so they're really interesting to see how like different regions are approaching um, regulation. I think that uh, the MENA region is going to become um, a niche for, 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 for innovation actually, while you also see the US and everyone is just like, I feel that like right now in the US is a situation where they cut the head of the chicken and it's just like running in circles like crazy because they also are regulating based on, on I, I don't even think it's fear, it's just based on panic of what happened with FDI. And this is actually really problematic because FDI was not a problem on the technology, FDI was a problem on people, corrupt people. And if we start to just like do regulation for technology based on that, then this is not going to end well for, for, for anyone. So I'm actually happy that Europe didn't follow um, the US on this approach, uh, that we are like more open to talk to, 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 to the industry and like the meetings that we are having with like community players, industry players and regulators actually shows this willingness of Europe to listen what is out there. The fact that there is always consultations asking what is going on, not only in Europe, but also UK. Like this just like brings like more um, hope, I think, <laughs> uh, rather than just operating in, in a system of uh, being scared of what happened and not even trying to understand that this was not the technology. It was just like bad people and the trust of like good people put it in the wrong place yeah yeah definitely i mean it was a lot to um, process right now but i uh, wrote down some questions uh, based on that uh, you were talking about the technology right so um, basically that the higher ups or the government doesn't really understand this technology of course they maybe heard something about silicon valley uh, silicon road sorry that way and uh, always that connection with blockchain but if you really go into the tech right it's it's the, quite the opposite if you know a certain address uh, who it belongs to you can track the whole transaction um, uh, query or development of that wallet right or how the flow uh, the money flows from one wallet to the other one um, and with cash you can't really do that so i think there was i mean you were mentioning statistic, uh, statistics right so there was even one that stated that um, cash is even worse than crypto in a certain way because well basically you can you can trade it underhand to terrorist organizations or to buy drugs and stuff like that right yeah, I actually have the number in front of me because I was working on, on that paper before jumping here. Just let me... Yeah, so according to the United Nations, roughly 800 billions to 2 trillions of fiat is used for laundry, and this is on a yearly basis. 
and crypto in 2022 was close to 23.8 billions. So like the difference is massive. <laughs> like yeah. I'm not saying like it's not like a relevant number. Of course it is, but when you compare to cash, is 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 bananas. So like we cannot like keep saying like it is worst uh, or like uh, as I mentioned, like I think that that's a big misconception or or like lack of understanding. Um, we we had a really interesting conversation this morning as well um, with with some people that I was discussing about like uh, pri pri priorities for. For, for like discussion with, with regulators. And one of them was like this uh, also um, kind of dichotomy between uh, anonymous, uh, like the anonymity that is on the DLTS space and actually the, the need for regulators and for like everyone to understand who is mm -hmm. behind the transaction. And one of the things that I was saying is just like, that like they shouldn't be, like they shouldn't contradict themselves, right? Because like I can have my, my transactions done with my self-hosted wallet and like like they don't need to know actually that I'm there unless that there is a red flag and says like hmm, this 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 wallet this account it might be into some weird things and yeah. actually what we need to know is like IOTA Foundation I I I I love a concept that I created that is called um, uh, identity on demand and it's basically that I don't need to share it they don't need to know it. But if there is a request for an authority to actually know who is there, I have the tools to actually like say, this is the person behind here. That, that means that like, I don't need to disclose the information at any point unless that there is this request. So it's more in the ability of actually being able to disclose it. That's why identity on demand. So you mm -hmm. can actually like show it. But like, I only need to do that if there is actually a risk. And this is like a better approach. It's like a risk approach. It's just like, if there is a red flag, then I need to know who is there. Otherwise, just let the people do their business, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, we even got a comment from Adri Wishman, uh, Wishman on uh, that one as well. I mean, on the whole um, thing we were discussing. He says that Andy Greenberg calls Bitcoin the most transparent financial system in existence in his book, Traces in the Dark. And yeah, it's basically just what, what we were talking about right now. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah. Or, or maybe you go first. I didn't want to interrupt you. So. No, it's, it's just um, I also heard a um, member of the commission in a panel actually like saying that crypto was the most democratic thing ever. And I, and I have like my reserve on that. Like I would say that is 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 the most centralized this decentralized uh, system right now. I wouldn't call it democratic. It's just because of terms of of access. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. Ali, please send it send that to me. I would love to read it also. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, maybe coming back to the topic on this one, I think uh, maybe. Uh, going back a little bit further even uh, on regulation on smart contracts right that was also a thing you were just mentioning um, one example that comes to mind is of course the tornado cash stuff that was happening around right so even the developer who just deployed the smart contract for everyone to use um, had to live with the consequences because he uploaded it on chain and he couldn't take it down anymore right so how do you feel about that whole story if it rings a bell I don't think that that's only a thing with the smart contracts is um, I think that that's a big issue right now. And we have seen some intents of uh, different regulations to actually uh, try to push liability on developers. And I think that that's a huge mistake. Um, as I see it, and this is just my personal perception, is that whoever wrote those things has no idea how software development works. Like, I'm a lawyer, like, I'm not a technical person, but, like, I just talk to the people and I understand, like, like how this is completely insane to just actually put liability for bugs. Like, I, I saw one that it was actually, like, saying that, like, once you launch it, like, it needs to be perfect. And they are actually were understanding, like, bugs as a, as, a, as, a, as a mistake on the coding. And I'm just like, this person has never talked to a developer. And this is actually, like, why I'm pushing so much to generate this bridge people talk to each other because these kind of things like this is not helping anyone like the industry is not going to be more secure but making every developer be liable for things that they have no control whatsoever and that needs to be tested right and they're just not talking to each other and that's that's a that's a 
is really concerning because like honestly when i read those pieces i'm just like this person not even made their homework like as minimum just go and talk to them ask them like how actually is the process of doing software development not only for blockchain for for anything to understand what a bug is how, what is the liability like how you can actually like do something about it so i wouldn't say that that's an issue only with the smart contracts of course there's it has more relevance in the smart contracts right now because of it's like the the hot topic, but this goes beyond that. Like this is go for like the, the whole industry. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like you're talking about, you don't even see all these issues, right? I think the original developer just simply wanted to uh, get even more privacy into the blockchain, right? So maybe for those that don't know, uh, Tornado Cash actually works. So basically, a lot of parties can put in uh, their funds into a single smart contract. And after waiting some time, uh, you can take it back out to another uh, wallet address. And at the end, or at least that was the idea behind uh, this whole thing, is that nobody can trace back the funds uh, that were coming from, let's say, um, um, terrorist wallets or maybe from yeah yourself. Those things and... are going to be completely forbidden right now like mixers, yeah. for example. Those are one yeah. of the things that I, I think there's no, no, no way to bring it back uh, because those were actually like enabling um, the small portion of people trying to do bad things to actually doing it easily. So uh, this is also already uh, being discussed on the MLR and mixers, for example, are going to be Bun. Definitely out of the way. Yeah. I think uh, right now they are blacklisting wallets that are interacting with it, yeah. right? So if you try to get the funds out on an exchange, it will be definitely reported or something like that. Yeah, um, um, but th that's that's also like really interesting because this is the industry itself. Like like those uh, blacklists, they are not like coming from regulation or like they are not coming from like a like the regulatory point of view. This is the industry itself, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I have seen that is really proactive on the crypto industry and is that like we try to find solutions faster when we identify a problem because regulation will like take forever to be negotiated so it's the industry itself like being super proactive and say like oh we have a red flag here let's see how we can um actually address it and this with the with the blacklist is like pure cooperation between exchanges like they talk to each other and, and like share this database of information uh for others to use otherwise like it will be like blacklist here, blacklist here, and then you just like jump from exchange to exchange until you just find one that actually like um, let you to turn into fiat. Yeah, and definitely. And uh, maybe to to stay in that whole uh, bubble or topic of liability and smart contracts that have possibly some uh, error codes in them, I think it happened with um, Ethereum as well, right? So there was this one uh, instance where a large amount of funds got uh, pulled out of the system because of a error a developer made on the first DAO smart contract or proposal or something like that. And uh, eventually this uh, led to the, to the first fork, uh, so to speak, of on the Ethereum network where a certain amount of um, DAO members or yeah, Ethereum members decided to go that way. Yeah. I, I think yeah. how much was it? $7 million back in that day? Yeah, uh, I'm not like 100% familiarized with the with the with the case, but I know that this was one of the reasons why like the DAO conversation was pushed back a little bit. Like it was just like starting to happen, and then this happened, so everyone got a little bit afraid, and then uh, it delayed a little bit the, the start again of the conversation. And now we are back on the on the flourish of, of the DAOs. Um, in terms of liability, there really complex question like I wouldn't make any assessments at this point because I also like don't know all the all the facts mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I also think that like that there are like different ways to 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 approach um, those 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 risks right and it's just like we cannot go back to the beginning and scratch everything that happened or like the good things every time that a, a, a mistake like this happened you know because those are mistakes and it's the same with like um, what I was mentioning. Like we cannot base regulation on what happened with FTI. That is one player, huge yeah. player, but it was a corrupt player. <laughs> like this is not the technology itself. The other one was also like a human error, probably a mistake on the code. So how we actually like start to like separate when we have these discussions of what like was actually a human error 
when implemented, deploying, or like working with the technology, and what's actually the potential of the technology to keep evolving and actually grow and mature so we don't have those kind of situations uh, um, as well. For me, like with the FTI, it was just like the big argument, like beyond like everything that happened. I'm really, I feel really bad for everyone that actually trusts them and put the funds there. But the, the good thing for us is like, that was my argument to say like, now you know why we need DeFi. <laughs> like this is exactly yeah. what we need DeFi. Uh, so it just like always come from, from, from those both sides and you just need to just like keep uh, pushing, keep talking, keep the dialogue there. So, so people don't, as I said, like panic and start running without like, like a chicken without hair, like in circles without knowing what is going on. But it's just like, okay, wait, take a break. This is one thing that happened. This is how we can solve it. This is how we will solve it. So the system gets better. And this is not only for, for, for blockchain in our industry, like that's how everything, absolutely everything works. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we even had it in the panel talk, right, with AI that it's still almost unregulated 100%, right? So yeah, this is something that... There is that... something going on, on on the table. There is the, that the, the um, AI Act, I think, that has been negotiating as well. So that will come. Uh, how that will look like, we need to see. But the appetite yeah, um, is there. Of course, of course. I mean, blockchain is... Uh, I mean, it's not a new technology so to speak of i mean the, the whole concept is coming from one 2009 or something like that with the first bitcoin white paper right coming out i think even the the origins are even going as far back as 1998 or something like that or 1988 um but that's yeah like, i mean that's like saying I mean, that like like i wouldn't just like go because that i'm saying that that's new or like not new because that like really subjective it's like saying like cars has not news but like which kind of car are you talking in? Like, you know, like we have like new use cases every day. Like every day there is something new coming on uh, and building on top of it. And as this is open source, but like this is like crazy to try to keep track of what is going on, right? So I will just like keep saying like these are new technologies and that's, that's, the, that's the risk with regulation right now because they are still like so early in development and there is like so much going on that if we put that regulation that will block the development, then I'm, I'm just like blocking the whole potential of innovation there, right? So I will still call it like new, <laughs> because that also like facilitates a little bit how you approach regulation and say like, it's, it's too early still, like give me, give me some time to figure it out, how we are going to move as an industry, what are the different potentials, use cases, and then we talk about like certain, certain rules or like minimum rules um, so we can protect consumers, um, but also you don't block the potential of everything we can build on top. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is happening only because of the public conscience rising on those topics, right? So, and, but like you said, we are still going in a certain direction. It's not in a centralized manner or maybe coordinated manner. I mean, every country, every district does uh, for it what it thinks is best uh, for the total thing. I mean, you mentioned that in Abu Dhabi you already can set up a foundation for a DAO or something like that. So that it works better. Right? There's a proposal to create a regulation for DLT foundations. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't think that is so discoordinated. Uh, for example, if you see it in like Europe, well, it just like help us a lot to, to be in the European Union, right? Because like we move as a region. So there is like some framework and then yeah. at the country level, you, you will adjust. But for example, Mika, I think that is a really good thing that happened for uh, um, crypto asset service providers in Europe. Because before you will need a license in every country, right? Like if you want to operate in Germany, you need a license. If you want to operate in France, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you get one license and because you are under the union and you have MiCar, that's it. You can operate in, in all Europe and that facilitates the process, less bureaucracy, easy for the CASP, uh, more secure for everyone. So I think that like when regulation comes into, into, into that particular spectrum where we are actually like creating a car, like unifying rules for everyone to operate and know what is going to happen and how to to move forward is 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 really really good to have regulation. Um, Mika for me is a good example. Now with the white papers, um, I think it's Article Five on Mika. It actually tells you what needs to be incorporated in a white paper. 
And when you read this from like the user perspective, it's amazing because it also includes like how you can do advertising or marketing about these, these tokens. And that as a user just like give you more trust. And if there is trust and there's not fear, then more people going to start to approach the, the blockchain, the blockchain sector and the crypto in the crypto industry. And at the end, and I think that I always say that like we can grow only as big as our own bubble. And if we actually want to have like global scale, we need to approach the day to then Pedro and Maria and actually explain them how to use this and how to interact with this. And this regulation actually is like making us well, like making the industry more prompt to talk via the, the white papers to these kind of users. Uh, so they feel that they can put their money into, into, into those casts, for example. So that's, that's a really great example of how regulation actually can, can help the industry to move forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's even more prevalent right now. I mean, I think most of the people didn't go in uh, because they wanted uh, it for the tech or so. I, I would most certainly uh, as a term that they went into it because it was uh, some kind of wild west, the uh, whole crypto unregulation space, right? I mean, there were so many people that made money off of it. Nobody knew really what, I mean, similar to AI, right? We got this parallel uh, there. And uh, now, like we're saying, all these people were, always shouting out for we need mainstream adoption we need to have in uh, people coming in from all these sectors and uh, now is finally coming the time and all these people are starting to cry about uh, those regulations that are as you have uh, stated um, yeah. fairly needed and in dire need there is also like a like the bc 100 plus initiative that i was mentioned that is with the with the un that's a really interesting way to do it uh, because the UN already has some credibility, right? And when you are working with them and they are like putting in a stamp saying like, you know what? I'm also interested in, in seeing what blockchain can provide, how blockchain can be used for certain use cases. Then that give you like a second level of trust in the normal user that says like, oh, wait a second. Like if the UN is using it, it's like these big NGOs that are like all for good and humanity and prosperity and sustainability are starting to look into this. Like, I also want to be part of that conversation. And that actually opens that door. So I have a um, really interesting discussion with uh, Save the Children's the other day because they're already exploring like what to do with blockchain and they have like different ideas. So I was like, okay, guys, like I'm really happy to be the bridge, but I'm not the one that you should be talking to. So I connected with like some community members that I knew were working on some of the solutions that they were interested in, even though if they are not a project working on sustainability in particular, but the toolings that they are creating for the industry are really interesting for, for them. So I just made the bridge and said, like, you two need to talk because <laughs> you want to do the same thing. Um, so just, just talk. Because like maybe you find ways in that uh, you can collaborate. We did like this super cool exercise also with uh, the Suna Labs uh, last year mm -hmm. when everything happened in, in Ukraine, and they wanted to do something to actually collect funds. And I knew some artists, and I did my research and found some NGOs that wanted to collaborate with them to do um, a, a, a donation campaign via NFTs. Uh, and it was really interesting because one of the NGOs already had like some experience with blockchain. The other one didn't have any idea, so they they actually like sent me a message one time like, hey, this was just a starting, right? Like we we didn't launch the campaign or anything. Like I was helping them to create their wallets, and then one of them just like sent me a message saying like, hey, by the way, uh, there was um, a situation, so there were some bombs, and we needed to run, and the computer was left behind. We cannot like recover the computer. Um, we had like our password there. Can you please send me an email and reset the password to our wallet? And I needed to actually explain how this industry works completely different. This is not like Instagram that you lose your password and it's gonna come to your email, but actually explain it like everything to them. Uh, and now they were like, oh, okay, we understand. Okay, like now we will have it with us differently and we'll reset like the wallets and everything. But this was a really interesting exercise because these kind of things can happen all the time, especially with people that is completely outside of the industry. And it was a really beautiful process with them. Um, this is kind of like the, 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 the examples of collaborations that I would like to see more in the space because this is actually blockchain actually solving problems that we have right now. It's not like... Like, it's not a matter of, like, innovation of the science of, like, new 
crazy ideas, but actually how we use technology to solve problems that we have here that is like impacting people uh, and people's life on the day-to-day -day basis. So I think that like that's one of my favorite examples on how to actually do that. And it was NFTs also that was like super like new for them as well. So it was it was a really, really great interaction. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, really important to to get the people into it through an easy to understand way, and not. I mean, uh, I come from the technical background, right? So I will most likely go and open up some kind of terminal and show some codes and then try to explain it that way. But um, yeah, like you were saying, we have to maybe approach it from a different perspective. Like we are trying to tell it to uh, a child or some sort of right, because it's really exciting tech. It's uh, fairly dangerous. I mean, like you were stating, if you lose your seed phrase or private keys, it's basically money is gone and there's no third party like a bank that could maybe uh, get a recharge of your money or some sort of this. And yeah. Um, I think that there's like also like, um, like the conversation is maturing also to adjust a little bit more to like civil population. Um, I think that was on the uh, Solbon tokens paper where they discuss a lot about like recovery methods. And I think that also like that in particular, when you are talking to people that has nothing to do with technology, is a really interesting approach. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but at least it's a, a really interesting approach to include them in the conversation. And once they actually learned a little bit more in a secure space, they can they can move to 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 other options on, on the space. So I think that like there's a lot of interest also for the industry to try to to start talking uh, to to civilians. Like I, I when I started in IOTA back in 2018, like as I say, I'm a lawyer. I was with the development sector. I was super interested on the technology because of the potential. But I'm not a technical person. So I always like reach out to people and say like, can you explain me as if I was like, this is playing me in mortal terms. What is it that you're trying to, to do with this so I can actually understand and then explain it to others? And this is a really cool exercise. And I think that um, I was grateful that I landed on IOTA because <laughs> everyone on the on the team was super patient and super nice. Then we have at some point an initiative called Eli5, Explain Me If I Was Five, where mm -hmm. people from the technical team will explain it to the comms team that, of course, need to understand what is going on to be able to communicate it to the lawyers that we need to understand, to talk to regulators, to the HR team, like what is an smart contract, as if we were like five year old and um, how the consensus mechanism work, what is the tangle, all of those things. And it was like really, really cool because it's the only way in which we can actually talk about it to other people that like us is not a developer. And I think that that's a really important thing that was put under the table for many years in the past. And now it's kind of like a priority because it's the only way to escape. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is also the reason why a lot of projects are struggling, right? Because they can't explain the ideas um, in, a, in a precise and concise manner. Yeah. But yeah, I'm seeing that uh, Holger Köter is waiting in for his talk. Um, so I think we should be ending uh, this discussion right now. Thank you very much for coming to TangleCon. And yeah, we are very grateful to uh, have you here and get so much insight on the topics that you brought for us. Thank you for inviting me and say hi to Holger. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right.